like to welcome everyone to this evening's talk. Ah, sorry, good evening, everyone. I'd like to welcome everyone to this evening's talk. Um, my name is Dinan. I'm one of the gastroenterologists in uh, Johannesburg. Um, I'd like to, uh, this is one of the Gecko sessions. It's hosted by the Gastro Foundation in association with Project ECHO, University of New Mexico. Uh, the Gecko Fellow Session is run every second Monday, starting at 6 p.m. And um, the chat will be open for questions, but um, feel free to notify us in the chat. We'll try and stop about halfway through for questions, and then again at the end, and then open the floor to questions and comments uh, later on at the end. Um, I'd like to... Welcome, Dr. Ram Mukhan, who is one of the fellows at the Universitas Hospital, um, and he'll be chatting to us about hepatocellular carcinoma this evening. Uh, thank you, Ram. Okay, good evening. I'm just going to share my slide now. Um, got it, okay. Okay, so we're talking about hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, okay, so most of the literature that uh, regarding epidemiology is from Western literature, and uh, we can gather that it's the most common primary malignant tumor of the liver, fifth most common in men, and the eighth most common in, in women. Um, in sub-Saharan Africa, we have the problem with it being underreported and underdiagnosed. So the data that we see is 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 not accurate. Um, however, there has been um, a worldwide increase in incidence, and it does um, occur more in males, with 3.7 males to one female. And if you were to look at the new cases alone, there's 854,000 per annum. Um, of just new cases and 810,000 deaths per annum relating to HCC. When you look at the etiology, um, basically it's anything that would cause chronic liver disease. So your chronic viral hepatitis, hepatitis B. So 25% of all the carriers develop HCC. And in... Um, Hepatitis B accounts for 80% of the HCC diagnosed in Asia and Africa. Um, so if a, if a person is diagnosed as a carrier of hepatitis B virus, um, they then face a hundred times increase in their lifetime risk to acquire HCC. Um, other factors that um, make patients high risk would be if they have a high hepatitis B viral load, if the E antigen is positive and genotype C was associated more with HCC, right? We also know that HCV, hepatitis C virus, has also been associated with HCC. And then once again, cirrhosis from any cause um, would be a, a risk factor for H HCC as well. Uh, metabolic associated fatty liver disease. Chronic alcohol abuse, hemochromatosis, alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, and Wilson disease. Um, it's also important to note that there also is a risk for patients who have non-serotic livers. Um, they also are at risk uh, for hepatocellular carcinoma. So it's not only in patients who have cirrhosis. You can also get it in, an, in a, on a structurally normal liver as well. Um, once again, risk factors, the viral infections, cirrhosis, and NAFLD are your major risk factors. And then you get your other conditions that can lead to cirrhosis over a long, which is um, your metabolic conditions, and then your inherited conditions, um, ataxia, telangiectasia, and hypercitrullinemia. Um, then we have your risk factors like smoking, most other malignancies as well. Diabetes could be related to the increase in the incidence of NAFLD. Um, and then we have dietary exposure to aflatoxins as well, typically found in grains. Um, and that's more popular in the Asian population and then Asia and Africa, and then the oral contraceptives as well. Okay, so hepatitis B virus specifically has direct and indirect mechanisms. Um, that lead to hepatocellular carcinoma. 
90% um, of all the patients with HCC have the HPV integrated into the um, DNA, and it's it's at random sites of cellular integration. So, so these these um, cellular genes then get activated um, due to the viral integration, and 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 that causes um, a disorder in the cell replication, and that also um, has changes that leads to the cellular DNA changes of the of the inherent DNA of the cell uh, after the viral insertion. So what actually happens is during transcription, these viral genes are then activated um, due to these new HPV encoded proteins. One of them in particular is the X protein. And then that uh, leads to the um, propagation of um, this malignant pathway. Also, you get activation of the jack step pathway. And then uh, due to the viral integration, there's also disruption in DNA repair and apoptosis as well. So there has been a direct link with HPV um, viral load and the risk of HCC. So the higher the viral load, the higher the HCC risk of more DNA insertion and more uh, damage on the DNA level. You get the indirect mechanisms, um, which is more due to the chronic neuroinflammatory disease, in, which is generally your cirrhotic process that ensues. Um, so the increased hepatocyte turnover rates, um, necrosis and degeneration. Um, and with that, you then get distortion of your architecture um, due to the cirrhosis. And then um, that also contributes to loss of control of the hepatocyte growth once that architecture is um, changed or damaged. Um, and then the inflammation itself then leads to reactive oxygen species, um, which also is um, pro-malignant. Um, and then the reveal study uh, showed that genotype C found in Taiwan and F in Alaska um, are more associated with hepatocellular carcinoma. If you look at hepatocellular carcinoma and hepatitis C virus, there's 71 million people in the world with chronic hepatocellular carcinoma. And all of these patients um, with HCV that develop hepatocellular carcinoma, they do have cirrhotic livers or chronic hepatitis. So hepatitis C has been found to be directly carcinogenic. Um, it does not integrate into the genome like hepatitis B. And if 5% of patients with um, hepatocellular carcinoma have a five-year cumulative risk, a five-year five 5% five risk, and seven, uh, a 7% five-year risk if they have cirrhosis. Um, now with DAA treatment and um, that induces SVR, it's been found to regress fibrosis. And when the fibrosis regresses, the risk of HCC has also been found to reduce. Um, so even if a patient is um, found to be in SVR after DAA treatment, they still can be at risk of HCC if the patient is already cirrhotic from the previous liver insult. Um, so cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma, so it's, it's found a, to be a global trend that um, hepatocellular carcinoma occurs in 1.3 per 100 patient years in any patient from, that has cirrhosis from any etiology. And if you factor in um, the specific etiology of hepatitis C virus, it raises that number to 3.7 to 100 per patient years. And in hepatitis B, two is to 100 patient years. And in alcohol, it's one to 100 patient years. Um, if you look at HCC and aflatoxin, um, it's derived from the aspergillus fungus in Africa and Asia. And uh, the mechanism is that it's believed to inactivate the third base of codon 243 of the 
TP53 tumor suppressor gene. Um, if you look at the other factors, hemochromatosis, we know excess iron is carcinogenic. Wilson's disease is excess copper, alpha 1 antitrypsin deficiency. And then we get um, the hereditary tyranosemia, type 1 glycogen storage disease. Um, so these are just the other factors that have been associated with um, HCC as well. HIV itself will predispose you to having associated viral hepatitis, so also uh, a factor to take note of. So the key molecular pathways um, in carcinogenesis for HCC, it's your angiogenic signaling, which is why that is also we used as a treatment, the anti-angiogenic drugs. Um, so you get your epigenetic promoter methylation and histone acetylation, your growth factor, tyrosine kinase mediated, and then your JAK stat signaling, um, and then your mTOR AKT pathways, your P53, ubiquitin, and your WNT beta catenins. Uh, this is just the molecular pathways. Um, so now if you move more clinically, um, your typical symptoms, if you start getting these symptoms of weight loss, change in general condition and abdominal pain, usually means you may have an advanced tumor by that point. Um, so in the setting of the cirrhosis, what would typically be a small liver may then become enlarged, nodular, and irregular, which can then point one to the uh, carcinoma development. Um, if the patient already has ascites, one should suspect peritoneal and local invasion of near biovascular structures. So here we have symptoms by frequency, um, abdominal pain, the most popular, um, weight loss, weakness, abdominal swelling, non-specific symptoms, jaundice, you can see is actually quite low um, compared to the others. Um, but in signs, you get hepatomegaly, ascites, fever, splenomegaly, wasting, jaundice, and a brewery. Um, other important signs is the perineoplastic signs. Um, the typical ones you may find is carcinoid syndrome, hypercalcemia, hypertension, hypertrophic osteoarthropathy, hypoglycemia, neuropathy, osteoporosis, polycythemia, polymyositis, porphyria, uh, sexual changes like loss of libido, gynecomastia, and feminization, thyroid toxicosis, thromophlebitis, migraines, and the watery diarrhea syndrome. Of note, um, the perineoplastic hyper, hypoglycemia has two types. We get the type A, which is related to uh, glycopenia um, that is just due to excessive uh, hepatic infiltration by the tumor re resulting in a lack of stores. And then you get the type B, which is due to um, pre-insulin-like growth factor two production by the hepatocyte. So that's more of a hormonal process. Um, so type A would usually signify, you know, a large tumor burden and type B is more uh, hormonal perineoplastic type syndrome. Um, so other perineoplastic features, polycythemia is due to the production of the erythropoietin factors. The hypercalcemia due to parathyroid related peptide. And the particular skin finding is called pityriasis rotunda, which looks with these circumscribed lesions with hyperpigmentation. So they're like around uh, disc type lesions with hyperpigmentation. Um, so when you diagnose an HCC, the gold standard is histology. Um, it, Imaging is also very sensitive, particularly the triple phase, otherwise known as the dynamic CT. Um, one can use tumor markers. Um, alpha fetal protein more than 400 is um, usually very suggestive of the diagnosis. And then 
once you start getting levels above a thousand, uh, the outcome for transplants is actually poor, or they have been associated with poorer outcomes. Um, one must remember other causes for raised alpha feta protein, which will be your germ cell tumors, testicular tumors, uh, pregnancy, other endoderm tumors, and then a liver that's regenerating after acute liver failure. However, if you see a rising trend of alpha feta protein um, progressively over a period of months, it's, it's more suggestive that the patient has developed a hepatocellular carcinoma. Um, imaging, ultrasound, the issue is that it's very sensitive to pick up a mass, but then it cannot distinguish that mass from a benign cause um, of a mass. Um, so therefore we use it for screening. Um, and then once you get to CT, we have the dynamic CT, otherwise known as triple phase CT. Um, so this looks at the hepatic blood flow supply uh, from the portal vein. And during neoangiogenesis, um, the, the blood flow to the tumor um, then shifts from the portal phase to an arterial phase. So we'll see this on the images just now. Um, so, so you get arterial hypoenhancement in the arterial phase, which is characteristic of this triple phase pattern, and then hypoenhancement in the venous and the delayed phase. So if um, the lesion is more than two centimeters and it has this particular pattern, um, its sensitivity is almost 100%. And um, there's the LIRADS radiology system, um, which this is a part of. So if one sees a differential for a nodule seen on the CT scan, one can think of a dysplastic nodule, an arterial portal shunt, an atypical hemangioma, a hepatocellular carcinoma, intrahepatic cholangiocarcinoma, confluent fibrosis, and aberrant venous drainage. So one must remember only hepatocellular carcinoma and cholangiocarcinoma would grow over time. So if you had to do serial imaging, the others would remain the same. Um, so if a lesion is less than one centimeter and it does not have that typical triple phase washout pattern, it can be imaged serially. Um, however, if, image is, if a lesion is more than a centimeter, um, it should be biopsied at the time of diagnosis. Okay, so, um, so here we see the, um, in, on a CT, um, so here in the portal venous phase, there's, we don't, you, you, you hardly see any mass here at all. And if you look in the delayed phase, you can see that there is some enhancement of this mass where the black arrow is pointing. Um, and then if, if one looks at the arterial phase on the bottom left, it's cut off. Um, one can see that there is take up within this uh, lesion on the liver as well. You can see the arterial enhancement pattern there. And then once again, on the delayed phase, you can see this hypodensity, which shows it's, it's, it's um, contrast has, has now left this area earlier than the rest of the liver. So this is the typical pattern that one would see on CT. Okay. Um, MRI can also be used um, to diagnose HCC. One needs to use gadolinium as well. So one needs to keep into account the patient's renal function as well before that's used. Um, the sensitivity is very similar to that of CT, so it can be used. And the findings particularly for MRI is that you have a hyperintensity on T2, which is specific for HCC, and also a hyperintensity, hyperintensity on diffusion-weighted imaging, and then a lack of enhancement using gadoxytic acid. Um, also, there is a LIRAD staging for liver disease um, for MRI as well, stages one to five, 
and uh, one being least probable for HTC and five being very. Um, so this is the MRI showing this hypointensity on your top left uh, in T2. And then you can see the differences in MRI between the arterial venous and the delayed phases. Okay, so there's also other imaging that we can do, which is your PET CT scan. It's less sensitive than CT and MRI, and the FDG PET can only detect approximately 40% of HCC. However, its usefulness is in detecting bone metastases uh, once a patient has been already diagnosed. Um, we also can use hepatic angiography, um, which is also useful when directing uh, catheter-directed therapy for chemo radio or bland embolization, and also for administering local chemotherapy. Uh, laparoscopic uh, diagnosis can be made um, for detecting peritoneal and extrahepatic metastases. And the advantage is that one can perform a liver biopsy of a mass under direct vision with laparoscopy. Okay, so if you move on to histology, um, histolog histological diagnosis is based on the international consensus panel, um, which includes these various immunostaining for these um, GPC3, HSP70, glutamine synthesis, BIRC5 uh, to distinguish the grade of the tumor. All right. Um, so if I wanted to look at it grossly, um, there's three main subtypes. There's the nodular subtype, which is the most common subtype, and it coexists with cirrhosis. It's characterized by round and irregular nodules seen on histology. Um, then you get the massive subtype, which is a large circumscribed mass that's more prone to rupture and necrosis, and it's found in the younger patients who do not have cirrhosis. And then you get your diffusely infiltrating subtype, which extends into adjacent structures like your portal vein. Um, if you have a well-differentiated tumor, then you would see a lot of bioproduction on your histological slides. So that's also a sign of um, differentiation. And you get further varieties, uh, which is the trabecular type, which is characterized by irregular anastomosing plates of cells. And then you get the asana type, which is characterized by gland-like structures. Uh, moderately differentiated subtypes, you get the solid subtype where cells are in masses or nests. You get the sarcomatous type, the serous type, which are narrow bundles separated by fibrous stroma. And then you get clear cell, which is indicator that they are high in glycogen or fat. So the undifferentiated type gives you pleomorphic cells with bizarre giant cells in variable shape and sizes. You may see globular highline structures that represent the presence of alpha feta protein and alpha-1 trypsin, otherwise known as Mallory's highline. Um, and then you get the progenitor cell HCC, which is progenitor stem cell activation during chronic viral hepatitis and cirrhosis. So these cells stain positive for cytokeratin. Here we have um, a histological slide showing um, these are, this is more the, the glandular type on, on the right. And on the left, we see local lymphatic invasion. Um, and the bottom left, um, we also see uh, this tumor as well. It's um, also infiltrating. So all of these pictures are pictures of hepatocellular carcinoma. We can see there's um, a lot of nuclear activity and eosinophilic nuclei and um, uh, with dense uh, cytoplasm. Okay, um, just something else to include is the metabolic scoring system that we use. Um, very often you hear people talking about it. So if one means there's no fibrosis, if 
sorry, F0 and no fibrosis. F1 means there's portal fibrosis without septa. F2 means there's portal fibrosis with septa. And three is numerous septa. Uh, sorry, I mean, it's supposed to be um, numerous uh, areas of fibrosis without septa. And then four is uh, cirrhosis. And then there's also the activity index as well. Um, and then you get a distinct uh, variant of HCC called the fibrolamella variant. Um, this occurs in very young patients and there's the equal gender distribution. These do not secrete alpha fetal protein and it's not related to chronic hepatitis B or C. So these are typically young patients who um, you find with a mass and they have a non serotic liver. Um, the prognosis is better than your other HCCs. And microscopically, you will see plump, uh, deeply eosinophilic hepatocytes uh, surrounded by fibrous stroma. So these are less likely to strain for your traditional uh, markers for HCC. When HCC does metastasize, it typically would go to your lungs, lymph nodes, and your adrenal glands. And this was found in 40 to 57 percent of all patients at autopsy that had HCC. Um, so when one looks at the staging of HCC, we still use the TNM staging. Um, however, the problem with this is it does not account for existing liver disease. Um, there are many staging systems that have been proposed. However, it was found that the uh, Barcelona Clinic liver staging, liver cancer staging system had the best um, independent predictive uh, power for survival. Therefore, this is the staging we use. Um, Dr. Dinan, would you like to make any comments so far? Um, actually, I just want to chat to the audience and see if we've got any comments or questions from the audience so far before we move on. We're about halfway through. Yeah. Guys, please feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or comment. Okay, there is nothing at the moment from carry on. Yeah. Um, so basically, we're now moving on to the staging of HCC. We've spoken about uh, risk factors, diagnosis, etiology, and so forth. Um, so basically, this is basically the, the, the most important slide when it comes to um, deciding how to treat your patient. Um, so it, it, it all goes down back. So once you use your imaging, you, you need your imaging what, to then decide at what stage your patient is in. So then if your patient is on, if you find your patient has a single nodule and they have good liver function, um, then you would then opt um, for um, a liver transplant upfront. Um, and then if the patient is a, a candidate for liver transplant, that would be your uh, first choice, first treatment option. Um, so, so essentially it's, it's important to have your imaging and your, diagno your histological diagnosis in order so that you can then work through this treatment algorithm here. So the, we'll come back to this uh, shortly. Um, so I've just oh, broken it I down just, into more digest. Just, yeah, sure. Yeah. Um, you can go ahead. Just pause on the slide for a second. Um, just to get all of the fellows aware that this is one of the most important slides when it comes to HCC. Um, and it's worth well, spending some time with, I know you're gonna go through it in a second, um, but there's a few basics we need on the patients that we evaluate. Yes, it is size. Um, 
the question with regards to biopsying the tumor, um, the jury's out, some, um, some units, some transplant units overseas require it and some are much against it due to the theoretical spread or theoretical risk of seeding the tumor during the biopsy procedure. So they opt that if you have good evidence for it on a good imaging study, um, such as a triple phase CT or MRI level with Primavist plus a, a significant alpha fetal protein, then you may not need the biopsy. Um, but um, important things to note is size, performance status, background liver function, and presence or absence of metastases. Um, and yep, go ahead. Uh, let's go into the different um, state aspects. All right. Um, yeah, so if, if you, so once again, as you mentioned, so you're looking at your size of tumor less than two centimeters. If the liver function is preserved with normal portal pressures and a normal body room, in other words, no signs of chronic liver disease, uh, with a single mass, one could then opt for a resection. Um, if you have signs of intrinsic liver disease, uh, then you would opt more towards a transplant. Um, if, if you find in the early stage, if the patient cannot have a transplant for whatever reason, then one would then look towards ablation therapy. So if you move on to the next stage, which would be an early stage A, a patient can have up to three nodules, as long as all of them are less than three centimeters. And once again, preserve liver function with normal portal pressures and bilirubin. Um, this patient would also be a candidate for a resection. And in, in the presence of liver disease, one would then opt more towards transplant. So if you find a patient has liver disease and comorbid disease as well, um, the comorbid disease would then preclude the patient from a transplant. Then one would then look towards ablation therapy. Um, if you move on to the further stages, intermediate stage B, um, this is your multinodular uh, liver with preserved liver function. Um, here you can, so by virtue of it being multinodular, primary resection would not be possible. So one would then look towards transplant. Um, we will come to the extended criteria shortly. Um, so if the criteria are met, then you could consider a transplant. And this is where you can consider transarterial chemo ablation, uh, chemo embolization for downstaging. Um, and then one could then consider a liver transplant. Stage C, once the patient develops portal invasion with extra hepatic spread and uh, preserved liver function, one would then consider systemic therapies, which would be your drug therapies, um, like atezolizumab and bevacizumab. So these are your anti-angiogenic drugs that we mentioned earlier. Um, and then it includes your um, sorafenib and lenvatinib. And once you reach the terminal stage, um, that would be your best supportive care, which means uh, palliative therapy. Um, so that was just a breakdown of this uh, flow chart. So you can see once again, so here's your terminal stage, uh, best supportive care on your far right hand side. And then your advanced stage, which is stage C, where patients are then allowed systemic treatments. And then if you go back to stage B, your multinodular liver, um, once again, preserved liver function and good performance status. These are your patients who would be candidates for your uh, transplant if they meet the extended criteria. And then taste if, if possible. And then if they have uh, diffuse bilobe extensive involvement, then we would consider systemic therapy. Um, okay. So, um, so points for optimal surgical resection in an ideal case so that you can ensure uh, more than 10 years survival, you would like to see a patient 
with one lobe involved, allowing for a segmental resection. The patient should have a child PUA status with a normal bilirubin, no portal hypertension, and a MAL score less than nine. This would be your ideal situation where you could, um, you know, have a more than 10 year survival rate. Um, this is just looking at your various options available, surgical resection, liver transplant, radio frequency with ethanol injection, uh, transarterial chemoembolization, uh, this is systemic chemotherapy, targeted molecular therapies, and your immune checkpoint inhibitors. We'll go through them now. Um, the Milan criteria for liver transplant, um, so you're looking for a single tumor less than five centimeters, or if there's um, two to three lesions, each less than three centimeters, um, with no portal or vascular invasion and no extra hepatic metastases. Um, also, if a patient, this is the, now the extended criteria where the UCSF criteria downstaging protocol um, shows that 83.8% of these patients had a, uh, survived at five years. So this criteria is where you have no vascular invasion found on imaging. You have one lesion that might be more than five centimeters, but less than eight centimeters, or if there's two or three lesions, none of them are more than five centimeters, but if you had to add the total tumor diameter of all of the lesions, they're less than eight centimeters. And lastly, if you have four to five lesions, none of them being more than three centimeters, but the total tumor once again, less than eight centimeters. So, so this is the downstaging protocol where patients can be um, downstaged to, um, to then have a liver transplant. That's the UCSF criteria. Um, so when you actually look at the transplant, um, the first line would be, to, ideally you'd like the patient to fall within the Milan criteria. However, if they are at a higher stage, they can be then downstage, then fulfill the Milan criteria. If you have vascular invasion and metastases, it's an absolute contraindication. And uh, from the literature I read, cadaveric graphs have no contraindications. Um, when you move on to local ablation, um, they are potentially curable for lesions which are three to five centimeters that cannot be um, resected or transplanted due to the patient's choice the number and location of the lesions, or if the patient has intrinsic hepatic dysfunction, so if they child fuel B or C. And the methods used would be ethanol injection, radiofrequency ablation, and microwave ablation. Uh, chemoembolization also now done if the patient uh, cannot have local ablation. Um, it's considered due to size, number, and location. And once again, can be used for downstaging the tumor. So you can then work the patient up for transplant. Um, traditional chemotherapy, um, your alkylating agents and so forth have shown to have no survival benefit and the response rates are less than 20%. So we have the new small molecules, uh, just to cover a few of them. We have sorafenib, which is a... Um, RAF kinase and tyrosine kinase inhibitor of both VEGF, which is vascular endothelial growth factors and platelet-derived growth factors. Um, and then the levantinib, which is a multi-kinase inhibitor of VEGF uh, fibroblast growth factor and platelet-derived growth factor receptor and RAT and KIT. Um, then we also have the regorafenib and carbozaptinib which are also multi-kinase inhibitors, and nivolumab and primrolizumab, uh, monoclonal antibodies that attach to the program cell death receptor of the cells. There's other new techniques we have available, cryoablation, laser ablation, 
external beam radiation and uh, yttrium 90 microspheres. Um, so, so once we just move on now to surveillance uh, for HCC. And in a patient with cirrhotic, um, the, the guidelines say a six monthly ultrasound. Um, alpha fetal protein is not diagnostic, but the raising trend of the alpha fetal protein is suggested, which would then prompt further investigation. Um, so in a patient who is cirrhotic, who is child PUA, in a cirrhotic patient who is child PUC awaiting transplant, and um, a non cirrhotic hepatitis B patient and a non cirrhotic, um, sorry, it's, it's, it should be in, it should be actually F three patients. So um, you would then um, want to have them on a surveillance program for HCC. Um, so if a nodule is found that's less than a centimeter, um, one can then follow up in four months for surveillance um, of that nodule. Um, in non cirrhotic individuals, um, surveillance is not economically feasible due to the low incidence um, of ACC. All right. When you look at prevention of HCC, um, the biggest impact has been found due to the hepatitis B vaccination in childhood and high back, high risk groups. Um, there's also studies that show that consuming coffee has been shown to decrease the risk of HCC in patients with pre-existing chronic liver disease. Um, and also if a patient who has been diagnosed with viral hepatitis received prompt treatment, um, for example, hepatitis C and the patient gets a DAA, then that would also uh, help to prevent an HCC. So when it comes to palliation for patients with HCC, um, we, we can still use uh, paracetamol up to three grams per day. Um, one would like to avoid NSAIDs. Um, if the patient has bone metastases and intractable pain, radiation has been shown to be effective. Uh, benzodiazepines, due to the inherent um, liver metabolization uh, of the drug, can be an issue. So one should use with extreme caution, and if using it, uh, just a, a very much lower dose. Um, psychology as well, and end-of-life planning for the patient. Other tumors uh, for another day to discuss would be your intrahepatic uh, cholangiocarcinomas, your hepatoblastomas, angiosarcomas, and epithelial hemangiotelioma, and hepatic metastases from other tumors. Um, these are my references, and you're welcome to take any questions. Thank you for your presentation, Ram. That was awesome. It's a good overview of the HCC topic. Um, let's start off by just addressing a couple of questions in the chat. Um, sorry, Barbara, I hope I'm saying your surname correctly, Dr. Natukunda. Um, question two that you've asked, so question one, just for everyone to uh, be aware was kindly comment on the familial risk of HCC. Um, so there have been some articles out there about the family history of HCC is an independent risk factor for HCC. And once you combine that with viral hepatitis in the index patients, uh, that's been associated with a more than 70% increased risk of HCC um, with a viral hepatitis plus a family history. Um, Question two uh, was kind of comment on which patients must have a biopsy and which patients can have a HCC diagnosis based on imaging only. Um, so it's actually a combination. Um, so the first thing to consider is the size of the lesion. Um, so if you look at ASLD, they talk about lesions less than a centimeter, one to two centimeters or larger than two centimeters. Um, so in your Less than one centimeter, the general advice is against the biopsy because it's too small and you may not get a uh, adequate sample thereof. Remember, you're always looking at this in conjunction with the 
um, enhancement features on a good triple phase CT or MRI level with Primavist. And you're welcome to do the other test if the first test wasn't that clear. So that means do an MRI Primavist after a triple phase CT or the vice versa. Um, so for lesions less than a centimeter, not generally recommended to biopsy, just from a sampling point, one to two centimeters with a um, suggestive LIRAD score on your imaging um, and uh, non-specific alpha feto where it's slightly elevated but not above your 400 or couple of hundred cutoff um, is generally the role for when we may want the biopsy to prove the diagnosis. Uh, but our center, Donald Gordon, particularly or very much against liver biopsies in these patients who may actually be transplant candidates. Um, once you're falling out of the potential transplant criteria and you're confirming a diagnosis for either uh, chemotherapy, especially in the private sector, but also to an extent in the public sector where you need to motivate for extensive or harmful therapies with regards to the chemo and the small molecules thereafter, there may be a role for biopsy confirmation of the tumor in those cases. Um, I hope that answers your question, Dr. Natukunda. Yes, it does. And then question three. Um, from what I've read, and um, I uh, get the senior um, hepatologist on the group to uh, correct me if I'm wrong, um, single large liver lesions from the studies done on transplant. Um, the reason they have specific cutoffs of the uh, five and six and a half centimeters, and there's different groups around the world that try to push the boundaries on transplant. What they notice basically is the larger the tumor, the more likely the risk is of microvascular invasion and spread. Um, and therefore the limits on size are actually, so usually by the time you are past six, seven, eight centimeters in size, there's usually gonna be some form of micrometastases and usually some form of vascular invasion. And um, I'm extrapolating for that. And therefore those larger tumors especially a 15 centimeter tumor in your question, which is probably the size of a normal liver, um, is definitely going to have some level of metastases or vascular invasion. Uh, so those larger tumors, um, if they are early child's pew status, no uh, other stuff, we would still try and offer them local regional therapy before systemic therapy, if they do have a good performance status and relatively preserved liver function. Does that answer your so, question? So, so then can I maybe comment as, as well here? Hi, it's Wendy. So, I mean, I absolutely agree. I mean, I think where we sometimes use tests to dance, to see whether we can downstage and make somebody transplantable, if they're sort of nine centimeters, sort of just above that ex extended criteria of eight centimeters, but once they're above 10, you, you can buy time for them with tests, um, but I think they're not going to be transplantable. But we certainly have managed to downstage with, with tests. And really just to agree with you, we, we I mean, the our imaging now with triple phase CT scan, MRI, MRI, Gallidium and Primavist, really one can tend to make the diagnosis on, on imaging now and one, one doesn't have to rely on, on histology. Um, I think where histology potentially might come into play as, is, is, as you say, if one's considering the, the chemotherapeutic agents and, and access to that. Um, but our imaging is really very sophisticated now, and one can usually make the diagnosis. Thanks. So, Prof, I understand you guys at UCT are doing, starting some studies with regards to the HCC cohorts, and we may be able to further define these HCCs in the future. 
Yeah, absolutely. So, I mean, if you look at the histology, I mean, if you look at those who have a very high alpha feeder protein, you know, those are poorly differentiated and they're more likely to be metastasizing than those that have a low alpha feeder protein. And I think the interesting thing that's come up with Sanju's collection of patients with HCC and some of them with hepatitis B, where some of them actually very surprisingly have quite low alpha feeder proteins. So as we know, usually we expect to have a very high alpha feeder protein in hepatitis B. And certainly there, I think liver biopsies are potentially going to show us the, the tumor biology and, and give us some insight in how best to manage these patients. Yeah, that's one that I've never fully wrapped my head around. We've seen a few very poorly differentiated HCCs, very angry tumors with very low alpha fetal proteins. And Prof. Hale kind of attributes it to the fact that they are very dysplastic cells and therefore don't make, they're not resembling normal liver tissue and releasing the alpha fetal protein. Um, but um, yeah, so if we go according to the British Transplant Society, they use a hard cut of that alpha fetal protein of a thousand um, higher than that, that they will not offer a patient with a transplant. Um, but when it comes to transplant, I actually like the combination of a few, um, especially the metro ticket, um, which takes into account the tumor burden, so number of nodules, size of the largest nodule, and the actual alpha fetal protein level, um, and tries to incorporate that and offer you sort of a risk uh, scoring of five-year predicted survival rates with and without transplant which allows you when you're sitting in front of the patient to offer them a better understanding of what we're getting ourselves into. Hello? Hello? Hey, sorry, um, I'm on my phone. Hi. I can't see where I raised my hand, so apologies. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think, I think the whole uh, concept of tumor biology is gonna be um, and, and, you know, precision medicine is going to become uh, increasingly important for the management of HEC, not just in terms of um, chemotherapeutic options with various uh, checkpoint inhibitors coming up um, uh, and, and, and immunotherapy uh, uh, options starting to become more and more available for these patients, but also in terms of transplant. Um, you know, I've been talking about that Toronto criteria that you know, you can, you, you can effectively, if you've got a biopsy on, on the, on, uh, uh, on the HCC, it's any, any number of tumors, any size of tumor, as long as certain criteria are, are, are kept. And, and within that means that, you know, they need to be well differentiated, no microvascular invasion, alpha fetal protein less than 500, I think is, is, is what they want, not even the less than uh, 1,000 um, that UNOS, UNOS requires. Um, uh, um, and obviously, you know, no extrahepatic disease or vascular invasion. So that's probably your current most lenient um, uh, 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 guideline out there um, in terms of transplanting these patients. But, uh, you know, I, I do think we're going to be heading more and more towards that sort of precision medicine. I think just to, yep. just to um, raise about um, tests, um, I mean, I think we have to be realistic. Many of our patients are presenting with multifocal HCC with large lesions, uh, within a number of satellite lesions, and are not going to be, quite, you know, they're not going to be criteria for transplantation. But I think we've had quite a bit of success now with using tests and using tests up to three or four times. So shrinking that big tumor bringing, and, and particularly if they've had a good response to the alpha feeder protein dropping by 50%, we've actually done in quite a few patients now up to three to four tests. And we've actually gained almost two and a half years in many of these patients. So I think we need to not be too nihilistic um, because I think tests is something that we can, we can offer. Thanks, Prof. And uh, just a note for the fellows, just to echo um, the one of the comments made in the box um, by Dr. Gogela. Um, the problem with HCC that we find 
is that we always pick it up too late. Um, and it is therefore very important that all of our cirrhotics um, patients with viral hep with proven F3 fibrosis and above um, get enrolled into these HCC surveillance programs. There, um, That is the way we will pick up tumors earlier at a point where there's more that we could do about it potentially. Um, and also just to be wary that HCC should be in the back of your mind when you're plucking that decompensated cirrhotic um, in the clinic or in the ward. Um, and we should always keep an eye out for that um, in a newly decompensated cirrhotic. Do we have any other questions, guys? Dylan? Okay. Um, we, you. Dylan, um, sorry, sorry, uh, apologies for joining in late. Um, but um, uh, did we discuss in terms of uh, candidates for just straight liver resection as opposed to um, transplant in terms of surgical options? We briefed over it on the new BCLC table below. Okay, cool. Do we have, I see we have some surgeons in the audience. Do we have any specific surgical related issues with regards to HEC? Medical fellows, any questions from your side? Um, if um, not, it's then, too, oh. Sorry, did right? a quick last question. Um, I was wondering at the Donald Gordon, how many transplants do you do for HCC per annum? So I guess I'm trying to get a gauge of that compared to say for other indications, you know, like PSC or whatever. Um, most times we're getting them too late. Uh, I think last year we did two for HCC uh, or two or three for HCC, um, but in that time, um, I've tried starting to downstage about seven people, um, mm. but only one managed to get to within UCSF because we use UCSF as our uh, standpoint. Um, for a couple of patients, we've even tried, um, so we use, we previously used within UCSF for cadaveric list transplantation eligibility. Um, and there were a couple of discussions that we had where we would offer a, um, according to the Metro ticket, down to a 50% five-year survival um, if there was a living donor uh, where both the donor and the recipient fully understood the risks of disease recurrence and the risks of surgery to the donor. Um, mm -hmm. We had entertained a couple of those. I don't think we've actually done those, but usually we are getting patients too late, too far out of criteria. Yeah. All right, so it's still not- And our lists, and no. And what we're struggling with at the moment is the ones we're getting earlier Due to our long wait list on the cadaveric list, uh, there is a few that have had progression on the wait list. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, Dinin. Uh, Prof. Um, uh, Mesh, um, the uh, adult liver transplant audits are available online uh, at the Vitz Donald Gordon website. Um, and I've just had a Quick look now while Dinan was talking. It mm. doesn't specifically say HCC, it rather says uh, malignancy, of which the majority then would be HCC. Um, okay. I don't have last year's figures here, but in 2021 it was 14, in 2020 it was 11, um, 2019 6, 2018 9. Wow. Um, 
So yeah, there are there are a fair number, and that I don't think includes patients who have who were subsequently found to have an incidental um, uh, found to have an incidental lesion. Yeah. No, that's helpful that they're online because if I'm not mistaken, and the surgeons here can correct me, I think here a lot of the liver. Oh no, so the resections yeah are for metastases. We're talking transplants. Yeah, okay, thanks, thanks, um, thanks, Bilal. Yeah, cool. Okay, guys, it's two minutes past seven. Uh, I think we can bring the meeting to close if there isn't any other comments or questions. I'd like to pres I'd like to thank uh, our presenter, Dr. Mucken. Um, I'd also like to thank Echo New Mexico and the Echo India team for the support. Uh, note the recordings will be available on the Gastro Foundation website. And I'd like to thank the Gastro Foundation for making this uh, teachings available and having all of the uh, big professors from all around the country available for us to have a chat and learn from. Um, and uh, next week's, uh, the next presentation will be on the 13th of March, uh, 2023. Uh, topic is autoimmune liver disease. It will be presented by Dr. Elizabeth Gatley and the chairman will be Dr. Kogela. And with that, I'd like to thank everybody for joining and have a good evening. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Thank you.